Good morning, North Livingston. It's good to see you all in the house of the Lord this morning. If you would, let's stand as we open our service with a time of prayer. Have a beautiful sunny morning going on. Uh, as we have prayer this morning, uh, the list will be on the board. Uh, I, again, I ask that you just, if you have updates to that, please let myself or Miss Amelia know so we keep that up to date. Um, received an update this morning. Um, this is distantly in Daryl's family. Kyle Fruge uh, was in a car accident several weeks ago, has had several surgeries, um, had to have a leg amputated this week. Just a young man and uh, just still needs prayers. He's got a lot of, uh, lot of issues going on and the family has reached out once again through Daryl and asked us to continue to remember him. He's been on the list for some time. Uh, just continue to remember all the many others that's been on the list. We've been praying uh, for our community. Continue to pray for our community. Pray for our church, leaders of our church. Uh, we've been praying for the Wednesday night. We had a good turnout Wednesday night with the youth. Uh, continue to pray for that uh, uh, ministry. Pray for the leaders. Uh, there's a little bit of um, a reorganization. We've got so many older ones coming now on, on a Wednesday night, so we're excited for that. But to just pray for the, the leaders as they work uh, the things out there and uh, pray for all of the ministries of the church. We've uh, 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 just a, a real need for uh, the, the, the church to be the light in the community. And I just pray that we be that light and, and pray for our sister churches. We'll pray for our uh, elections coming up in November. A lot of, lot of important uh, things uh, happening in the country right now. And we want to pray for the leadership. Uh, scripture tells us to pray for, uh, he says, pray for the kings. We don't have kings, but we have leaders. Uh, says pray for our leaders, uh, those that are in authority. And, and as I've shared with you before, uh, he gives us the, re us the reason for that then. That's so that we may lead quiet, peaceable lives. And I don't know of anybody that uh, doesn't appreciate a quiet, peaceable life. So that's why we pray for our leaders. Pray for the leaders in our church, um, not just our church, but the leadership of our church and our convention. A lot of things going on there. Uh, you'll see uh, the backpacks over here. Uh, that's the missions emphasis. This is our uh, month of missions emphasis for Eliza Broadus, which is our, our state missions. We uh, named that after Eliza Broadus. She was a, a missionary uh, uh, supporter, missionary uh, many years ago in the state of Kentucky. And so that's for our state missions. Uh, we'll be receiving the offering for that. And Joan's going to share more with us about that in just a moment. But the backpacks are just one of the things. Remember, uh, we'd like to have those in um, by sometime the 1st of, of October. Uh, we'll be taking those to the association and they'll be passing those on uh, through our, our um, Kentucky Baptist Convention to get those distributed in time for Christmas. So uh, instructions for that, if you've not gotten your backpack, I think there's still a couple on the back at the sound booth and the instructions, everything that goes in that is back there as well. And you'll see the Bibles are here. We'll put those in. So you be praying for that, preparing for that, praying for all those that would receive those. Do you have updates for our prayer list? Anybody have any additions or, or updates? All right, let's go to the Lord in a time of prayer. Father, we thank you for this Lord's day. Again, Father, just the wisdom of the first day of the week set aside that, that we come together God, his family, his church, and, and Father, we just appreciate the, what we realize is just a privilege uh, to come together. Father, for those that uh, can't be here in person with us but are watching by way of internet, we're thankful for uh, that technology. And, and Father, we thank you for the reports of all of those each week that we get that uh, are, are watching the service. Even this week, just a glorious report. And, and Father, we just pray for those that are watching from home. Uh, Father, many of those have physical needs uh, God, some of those have reached out and, and, and just uh, have unspoken requests. And God, we bring those to you as well. Father, these that are on our printed list, God, so many uh, that are standing in need of, of a healing touch. Uh, Father, some that are going through adjustments in life, some facing uh, changes at their job, uh, some considering retirement and, and questions that they have. And, and Father, all of these things, whether it be healing or whether it be finance or whether it be relations or their job, uh, God, all of that, all of that is important to you. God, there's not a thing in our life uh, that, that isn't covered under prayer. And so, God, we come to you this morning. And as each one under the sound of my voice is, is uh, just praying their need to you right now, whatever that may be, a family member, a lost loved one, a need for healing. 
God, we just join our prayers. We join our faith together. Father, Scripture teaches us that we're to come together corporately. We're to pray for one another. We're to lift one another up. We're to encourage one another in prayer. And Father, we're to pray for one another when one is sick. Father, we're to pray for one another when one uh, needs encouragement. Uh, God, we're to pray for peace in, in situations. And, and God, those that have lost loved ones, God, we just pray for the Holy Spirit's anointing in their life. And God, as we all pray that, uh, that joint prayer together right now, God, we just come into the throne room. And, and, and God, we are, again, just reminded how blessed we are because of what Christ did on the cross of Calvary, because of that empty tomb, because of what happened in the temple complex that day with that curtain that separated the common people from you. And God, now we have access direct to you. Because of all of that, we come to you in prayer this morning. God, each of these needs that we've listed, each of these concerns, God, we just we come together asking, and, and God, we come in faith believing God, we pray for our time together this morning. We ask the anointing upon uh, Joe and the team and the musicians as they lead us. God, I pray for the time as we share in the word this morning. God, I pray for the anointing of the Holy Spirit on, on me that it not be my thoughts or, or my words, but God, you just take over this morning. God, you've done that so many times. And God, I ask today that you just take over and God, you just share with us, what would transform us, what would change us, what would make us more Christ-like, what would make us that great commission Christian that we would have that burden for the lost and that we would seek to see everybody come to the knowledge of, of salvation. God, we love you this morning. We thank you. We commit this service into your hands. And all of God's people said, amen. Sister Joan, come and share with us. And then Joe, you come right after her and lead us. As, as the week of prayer is always a week, but we take it through the whole month of September. And this is the week of prayer for Liza Broadus, State Missions. And uh, Logan, that tall Logan is my post today. Can you believe how he's grown? But anyway, as we get into our offering, you pray about what God would have you to give. Our goal is $1,500. As we said, as David Doyle said in Sunday school, God loveth the cheerful giver. He does love the cheerful giver. So you pray about what God would have you to give so that missions can be shared with people in Kentucky. It's going to help. And, and the st statistics are amazing how many lost people are in Kentucky. You know, we live in this community and we see all the churches on corners and we think, oh, you know, but I'm telling you, it's a lost world out there and there's a lot of people that don't know Jesus. So you pray what God would have you to give. Let's reach that goal. Let's don't just nonchalantly, let's go for that goal and see what we can give for Jesus Christ. Today, we're gonna to be showing a video of, at Grayson County in Kentucky. And it's a ministry that's going on and I won't tell you, I'm gonna let you see it. So you all watch the video and I want you to see where the money God gives you that you turn around and give back what that money is doing for his ministry. So you all pray what God would have you to give. Keep believing that we're going to get our goal and that the state of Kentucky will reach their goal because there's people out there needing that. They need to be told that there is a Savior, a living Savior, and people need to come to know Jesus before it's too late. But they need to know him so they can have a rich life with Jesus Christ. So you watch this video and thank you, Logan. Center for Women's Ministries ministers to women and teen girls uh, in the emotional and spiritual areas of life. We are able to offer our services free of charge to women. Um, you now sometimes we, uh, there's a study guide uh, and of course we have print materials but a woman does not have to feel obligated to pay for any of those. So the Liza Broadus monies uh, go towards a lot of those materials and they also uh, go toward helping us get out in the community and taking uh, not only knowledge of our services to women in the community, but um, taking the gospel out there. I have been coming for a long time to the same group of ladies and we have become so close 
And I know that anything I share with any lady in this facility is totally and completely confidential. It will never get outside these doors. The other thing that this ministry has done is open up an avenue for me to use my art. It's, it's almost therapeutic. God used it for me in my life. So I thought, well, if there was some way to use that in ministry, I would like to do that. So I tried it with our group here and uh, it seemed to get a real positive response. So it has really opened a door for me to use my art to bring glory to God's name. I became involved with the ministry center after my husband passed away. And I got a, a letter in the mail or like a little announcement about surviving the holidays, you know, when you're grieving. And that's when I, I went to that and I, that's how I, I got my feet wet, I guess you'd say. The support of other women who have gone through what I have um, has made a huge difference because I felt so alone and isolated. Staying isolated can be a very dangerous place for a Christian to be. Um, so I felt like that was just a, a playground for the enemy to work in my mind, uh, to feel like I was alone and, and that um, I didn't have a purpose. So being able to connect with the women gave me a purpose. My heart and my passion is for the women of this community to know their value and worth in Christ um, so that they can walk in their true healing. And, and that's what I feel like this ministry offers outside of anything I've, I've seen. Coming here and going through a couple of the classes, I realized it's not about self-worth, but it's about God-worth. I didn't have a lot of self-worth. I felt like I needed to prove something, um, to have approval of others in order to feel like I was worth anything or my self-image. And now I know who I am in Christ. and. I don't need the approval of others to feel valued. And so that has been an important growth in my life. Most of the women coming here, and, and really myself included, even when I began here, we don't have a very good image of ourselves. The analogy that we use is the comparison between a paper cup and a crystal goblet. The world will tell you you're that paper cup. Common, you're cheap, disposable of not much value, but the crystal goblet is how God sees you because you are his precious treasure, his chosen treasure. A crystal goblet is set before a beautiful place setting at the king's banquet table. If we can help women see themselves as God sees them through the eyes of scripture, then we've accomplished our goal. Good morning. It's good to see each and every one of you this morning. We got any birthdays or anniversaries today? See none. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna do a new song this morning, and uh, I know you've heard it before because Amelia plays this sometime at the end of the service. But every time she plays this song. I've always said, what, do you, what is that song? And I'd get behind her, and finally I got her to, and she can sing too, did a lower key. But I had her to sing this, and we was kind of humming along, and so we've been practicing on it. So it's at the corner of Glory Avenue.
see James and John and Paul. Peter and Silas, I'll meet them all. Savior, my God.
presence of the Lord is in this place. so good.
is so good. Sing it. God is so before you today, Lord, giving you thanksgiving and praise that you deserve. God, thank you for your spirit here with us today. God, I just pray today, Lord, when we leave that we can all say that it's been good to be in your house. Refreshing breath of your word upon us. Pray, God, for Brother Danny, Lord, as he breaks the bread to us. Pray, Father, you just open his mouth, Lord, and you would fill him, Lord, with the words that we need to hear on this day. God, I pray for each and every one that's here today. I pray for the ones that are watching at home. I'm praying for the ones, Lord, that will be watching some other time, Lord, because maybe they can't see the service today. Just pray, Lord, that you would touch them, Lord. Fill their homes with your spirit as well. God, we invite you here. Father, we do know that you're God of the universe, God of the heavens, God of all. God, you are so good to us. Pray for the, those, the Lord, that don't even acknowledge who you are. Pray, God, that their eyes would be open. Pray, Lord, that the scales would be removed from their eyes and that they could see you, Lord, in your glory, in your goodness. May God and direct the rest of this service in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask if you'd open your Bibles to the Psalm 95, the 95th Psalm. Last week we looked at the 91st Psalm, being a psalm of life, we talked about where we need to be dwelling and living under the protection of God's hand. And then we talked about Psalm number 90 uh, being a psalm of Moses, a psalm of death. And now Psalm number 95, remember all of the psalms were uh, the, the hymn book uh, that they used to sing in, in their acts of temple worship in Judaism, in Israel, in the Jewish temple. And so these were recorded and God in his wisdom had them put in our scripture, the canon of our scripture because of their encouragement to us. However, sometimes I think they're not only encouragement, sometimes they're a challenge and then sometimes they're just instruction. And what we get in Psalm 95 tells us when we come into the church uh, as they came into the temple, uh, the reason we come, what we're to do. Uh, we call this 11 o'clock hour worship hour. What does that mean? Uh, we have discipleship hour at nine o'clock, Sunday school hour at 10 o'clock. Uh, I've had people to ask me before, well, what is discipleship? What do you do? Well, that's where we train to be disciples of Christ. That's the, the, the goal of what we should be doing in that hour so that study uh, during that time is how to be a disciple, a follower of Christ. That's for the Christian. Uh, that's to, to dig deeper. A Sunday school hour, that's where we go to school on Sunday. We learn the Bible. We, we study the Bible, familiar stories, new stories, lessons, daily application for life. And then we come to the 11 o'clock hour. A lot of churches have changed that time, but traditional Western Christianity uh, I think the majority of all churches at one time or another uh, in, in their historical uh, case, uh, this 11 o'clock hour, I don't know where that got started, why it's 11 o'clock, why it's not 8 o'clock, 7 o'clock, uh, but it, it, it's some reason, it, and we call this the worship hour. What do, we, what do we do in worship hour? What's worship all about? The churches I've always been in follows the format that we have here. 
Uh, we come in, we sing some songs, we share together, we fellowship, and then we have preaching. But what's that all about? Why do we call it worship hour? Jesus spent a lot of time talking about worship. The Old Testament uh, spends a lot of time. David spent a lot of time instructing on worship. When you think about David's life, David went from being a shepherd, just a, a guy that took care of his dad's sheep on the livestock farm, to being called by God to be anointed to be the king of Israel. And you'll remember the times of David as he was preparing to be king. And sometimes he questioned if that was even going to happen because the one who was king at the time wasn't all for that. In fact, he tried to kill him. You remember the battles that went on there. And then finally David became king. Known throughout world history as the greatest king Israel ever had. And yet we read of David's life and there were times when David messed up miserably. And yet in all of that, all of David's life from being a shepherd to being the one that killed Goliath to being the one that came after King Saul and Saul trying to kill him and then he became king and then sometimes he messed up as king and, and all that we follow of the greatest king, known as a king of war, and yet he spends so much time teaching us about worship. So let's read Psalm 95, and then I want to take a few moments just for us as the church. Uh, what is this worship? We want to look at what worship is. We've been talking on Wednesday nights about, uh, in our study on Wednesday night, about countering our culture and how that our culture today is, if anything, it's anti-God, anti-Christian, anti-church, and becoming more so all the time. And yet we as the church have to learn how do we exist in that? How do we live in that? How do we carry out what God called us to do as Christians in a world that's becoming more and more anti-Christian? And so one of the things we look at in there is, is worship. What do we worship? And we've talked about how that anything we put between us and God or we put before God, that becomes an idol. And all throughout the Old Testament, we see where they had idols. Even the New Testament, when Paul went into to Greece, they had all of these different idols in their Greek culture, all of these different things they worshiped. What does that worship mean? So if we have an 11 o'clock hour that we come to and we're supposed to worship, and now what is worship? What does that mean? How do we how do, we do that? What, what is worship? If God calls us to worship, what does that mean? So I'm going to ask that you stand as we look at Psalm 95. That's going to be a launching pad for this psalm on worship. Defining what worship is, how we worship. And then to break this psalm down to see how we're to, as Christians, worship God the Creator. The psalmist says in verse 1, chapter 95, Come, let us shout joyfully to the Lord. Shout triumphantly to the rock of our salvation. Let us enter his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout triumphantly to him in song. Have we done that this morning? Have we entered for this worship hour joyfully? Have we shouted triumphantly for who God is? Have we entered into his presence? We just sang that worship song. Surely the presence of God is in this place. Do you feel him? Do you sense him? And if not, why not? And if so, what causes that? What is this all about? Verse number three. Why? For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. The depths of the earth are in his hand and the mountain peaks are his. Think of that lowest part of the ocean that man has yet to explore. That's in God's hands. The highest, most majestic mountain on earth that's his. 
those stars when you look up in the sky at night. How many times have I shared with you about the night sky? That's God's creation. The sea, verse 5, is his. He made it. His hands formed the dry land. And here's the instruction of verse number 6. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep under his care. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on that day at Massa in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, they tried me, though they had seen what I did for 40 years. I was disgusted with that generation. And I said, they are a people whose hearts go astray. They do not know my paths. So I swore in my anger, they will not enter my rest. Father, we thank you for your word that these men of renown, men of old, many, many, many years ago, under your inspiration, took pen to paper and put your thoughts, your thoughts that became holy scripture for us to read today. We've just read who you are, the creator, the sustainer of all that is, how we're to come before you. God, may every one of us in this room today and those watching by way of internet, may we answer the question, how did I come into your presence? Why did I come into your presence? What difference does coming into your presence make? May the Holy Spirit challenge us to answer. May the Holy Spirit transform us that we realize when we're in your presence and that's more than just 11 o'clock Sunday morning, how that our life is to reflect that in the presence of the creator. I ask for the Holy Spirit's anointing and all that's said and done from this point forward. In Jesus name I ask, amen. You may be seated. The psalmist talking about worship, talking about God, who God is, and talking about coming into God's presence. And then God begins to speak. And God talks about how that we're in his presence and how we need to counter that, the opposite of what he called his children, his people, Israel when they were in the desert and they refused to live as he told them to, they refused to come into his presence as he told them. And God himself says here, inspires the psalmist to say, I was disgusted with them. I turned my back on them. That generation for 40 years, I let them wander in the wilderness and they did not enter my rest. Kind of puts a spin on God as being a living creature, a living being, a thinking creature, the creator. What does he think about us? What does he say about us? If, if he were to write about us in his presence, not just 11 o'clock Sunday morning, but every day, how do we as Christians, his children, how do we measure up to what Israel did? The psalmist talks about worship here. The, the dictionary gives a definition of worship. It says worship is a, is a noun. It could be a verb, but in this particular instance, looking at worship as a, a noun, it's the feeling or the expression of reverence and adoration for a deity. The worship of God. That's the, the clinical definition. The Bible kind of gives that a little 
different spin. When the Bible talks about the, the definition of worship, the Bible describes worship. Every time it uses that, that phrase, that word that means worship, it talks about giving of our entire self. That song, I surrender all. That, that's a biblical definition of worship. Giving our entire self, our thoughts, our emotions. When we come into worship on Sunday morning, and I have to admit, where are our thoughts? Boy, if the devil ever works anywhere, he can just work in the playground of your thoughts. Can he? I mean, of all the, what are you doing this afternoon? Where are you going this afternoon? What do you got to get done today? What do you got to, what do you got to do next week? What's going on in your life? I mean, just that, that's all that, that goes on. And, and God's competing with that. And so the Bible says worship is giving our entire self, giving our thoughts, giving our emotions to God's use. The Bible goes ahead to define it as, as all of life. And I'm paraphrasing a lot, taking scriptures here and, 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 and just putting in a capsule it's the entire act of submission. That's what worship is, submitting to God. How well do we do that? Our service to God. And, and, and the, the biblical definition, the, the service to God is, is not centered on time. It's not centered on place. I mean, we talk about the 11 o'clock hour and going down to the church house. But the Bible describes worship. Paul described worship as giving of our entire self, completely surrendering to God, not just Sunday morning at 11, but all of life being an act of worship. And that's what the psalmist is talking about here when he tells us to come into God's presence and he describes how we're to appear before God. Whenever, wherever, why? Because as Christians, we are the temple of God. You see at the cross, what the temple was, where the temple was, what the temple stood for, that all changed. You remember when they were, they were talking, the disciples had sat down with Jesus. Was it Mount Sinai? They, 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 not Mount Sinai. What, what was the mountain? All of it. They had sat on the Mount of Olives and, and they were discussing with Jesus that day and, and Jesus began to kind of tell them, this is the week before he dies. And they're asking him questions and they begin to describe the temple and talk about how magnificent the temple is. And in that time, just I think it's like Tuesday before he's arrested on Thursday, dies on Friday, he begins to tell those disciples, this, this temple will be torn down. And they're like, no way, this is never gonna happen. And like 40 years after Jesus' crucifixion, that temple was torn down. That temple completely collapsed in battle. The, the fires around the temple, they tell me, were, were so hot that the rocks that fell off of one another, the, the, the fires became so hot that all of the golden, ornate, everything in there began to melt. And the Roman soldiers began to sift through it to try to, to get what they could to get out. And to this day, we know where the site is, but that temple is no more. And the reason that Jesus gave that prophecy is because Jesus was giving that picture about what he was fixing to do on that cross and because of what he would do on that cross and because of his resurrection and because of his foretelling the promise that I have to go to the Father, if I don't go to the Father, the Father can't send you the promise and the promise is, you remember? The Holy Spirit, that third part of God. And what does he do? He takes up when you're born again, residence in your heart and you become the temple of God. And so wherever you are, child of God, you're to be in an act, an expression, submitting yourself in worship to God. And the psalmist, hundreds of years before that ever happens, begins to describe under the inspiration of God what worship is. 
And everyone, most everybody has a different take on worship. You can ask the, the Pentecostal what worship is. You can ask the Baptist what worship is. And you're going to get a totally different answer. You can ask a young aged Christian or a seasoned older saint. Define worship. It's going to be a bit different. They're going to see worship and the act of worship different. Go between a, a Baptist and an Episcopalian or a Catholic, a born-again Catholic, and get them to describe, to define for you the act of worship, what takes place in a worship service. We're much more informal than the Anglican, the Episcopalian, the Catholic. We don't go through all the rituals. I remember hearing somebody talk one time about going to a Catholic church for a funeral. And when they sat down, they said, oh great, they've got footstools here. And somebody said, not a footstool, that's a kneeling bench. They were Baptists. They had no idea that they had kneeling rails at every one of the seats. Completely different. And yet the Bible tells us, God tells us as Christians what worship is. However you define it, whatever your take, whatever your viewpoint, one thing I think we need to see in Western Christianity today is we need to if not discover, at least rediscover the dynamics of worship in our daily life. I have those friends that take communion every morning. That's their idea, their act, their understanding of worship. If nothing else, when I see them participating in that, when I hear of their participating in that, it reminds me that at least every day they're symbolically, they're reminded of their relationship with Christ. Maybe we need more of that. Some kind of a physical reminder. But definitely we need to rediscover or discover the dynamics of worship. Anytime you look at worship in scripture, you never find deadness associated with worship. It's always living and life and vibrant. The, the ultimate worship, if, if, if you read the biblical definition of worship, the highest form of worship that you'll find in Scripture is to study God's Word. I mean, when I say worship, you think of singing. You think of that time when we're, when, when we're under the, the, the worship hour, when we're, when we're singing songs, when we're praising, when we're lifting our hands. But the Bible teaches that the highest form of worship is studying God's word. When we hear from God, when we learn from God, study to show yourself approved unto God. This is your reasonable, this is your expected act of worship. That was Paul's take to the young preacher Timothy. Study, be in God's word. That's the most important thing you can do. Why? Because that experience is to transform us. It transforms us to, to have that experience from the Lord, a spiritual vi visitation. And when we do that, when we get in God's presence, and not just Sunday morning at 11, but every day, the act of worship in our lives, I believe if we would do that more, those that call themselves Christian, we would see a transformed land. When we talk about our culture and the things that are happening in our culture, where is the church? Where are the Christians? Where is our worship that God begs us to make a part of our daily life? It, it, it's almost as if we have a cheap counterfeit in the way that we live our life as American Christians, as Western Christians. When you see the results, when you see what's going on around us, but the scripture teaches, the Bible teaches, God teaches that if we live our life in a daily act of worship, submitting to him, surrendering to him. Well, look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. He says, the secrets of his heart, the, the highest act of worship, Paul told young Timothy, was to study, to show yourself approved unto God, a work when he not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 
And then he tells the Corinthians, he says, the secrets of God's heart, when you study, when you're in God's word, the secrets of God's heart will be revealed. And as a result, we, God's people, will fall face down and worship God, proclaiming God is really among us. That is the highest act of worship. A.W. Tozer said that worship, he thought in, in, in his ministry, he says, worship is the missing jewel in the crown of the church. Oh, if we just had more of that understanding and a grasp of what worship is. I think one of the problems in the church, the Western church, is that we don't have that biblical understanding of worship. Someone said of the American church, the American Christians, we have become a generation of people who worship our work, work at our play, and play at our worship. Now cipher that out. Look at us. We have become a generation of people who worship our work, work at our play, and play at our worship. And as a result, worship and all of the results have grown stale. And so has our passion for God. One commentary says, worship is the furnace of the spiritual life. And defining that worship is not just the 11 o'clock hour Sunday morning, but our daily life in the presence of God. But I'm afraid too many of us just come to church on Sunday because it's Sunday. And unfortunately in America, I'm afraid so many of us that, that do come to church on Sunday because it's Sunday, we forget that we're coming and we forget to prepare and we forget to come worshipful. And I don't mean to beat the choir up. You know, you hear all the time you're preaching to the choir. I mean, look at the ones who are not in church, but I, I'm thinking that absence of those that are here is a result of what we have become as far as the church. Far too many of us pick a church, choose a church, find a church that'll bless us instead of finding a church, becoming a part of a church, coming to church in order that we could be a blessing. So as we look at worship, let's very quickly run through what worship is not. If we look at what it's not, then we'll look at what it is. What worship is not. Worship is not an event. We call this 11 o'clock hour worship, but that doesn't mean that worship will take place at that 11 o'clock hour. What worship is not, it is not an event because you can attend a worship service. We've all done it without worshiping. Jesus echoed Isaiah in, in Matthew chapter 15. Jesus said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. That was the son of God that was about to die on a cross for the church, his bride. And as he looked at those who would be his followers, he said, just as Isaiah had said, talking about Israel, talking about those that pretended to be the church, but weren't the church. He says, they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from from me. So worship is not an event. It's not this 11 o'clock hour. Worship is not the music, although music is a tool that oftentimes brings worship. I mean, we, we're like all the other churches. We have a worship leader. We have a praise team. And many times they do take us to the presence of God. They do facilitate that worship but just having that music does not guarantee worship. You see, worship is not a performance. It's not an event. It's not the music. It's not a performance. I mean, we've, we've become a performance-oriented society. I mean, we pay big bucks to go to a worship concert. We pay people to bring us into the presence of God. But none of us should ever be spectators in this act of worship. You see, that whole definition of it being giving ourselves, our thoughts, our emotions, total surrender, that, you can't be a spectator and do that. 
when you describe, when you define, when you figure out what real worship is. Worship is not a feeling. Although emotions are, are exhibited in a time of worship, but worship is not defined as a, a feeling. It's not a cold chill. Worship is not a shiver down the spine. Worship is not a tear. Worship can be emotional, but being emotional doesn't mean you're having worship. And worship is not something confined to one day a week. That's where perhaps as the church, maybe we've made a, a grave error in calling the 11 o'clock time worship hour. So if it's not all of those things, if it's not an event, it's not the music, it's not a performance, it's not a feeling, it's not a spectator sport, it's not just one day a week, then what is worship? The Bible describes worship as a response to God. What the psalmist said, it's a response to God the creator. Look at all he says there that, that holds the depths of the oceans in his hand, that created all things that are, the mountain peaks. As he describes God, worship is a response to that God. First John chapter four and verse 19, the response to God, we love him because he first loved us. That is a, an act that brings about worship. He loved me when I was a bound for hell sinner. And yet he loved me in this way that he sent his only begotten son to die on a cross to pay for my sins, my sin debt. He redeemed me from hell. My worship is a response to God because God loved us, because God saved us, because God called us, because God provides for us. We respond to his mercy, his saving power. And in our life, our worship should be declaring his worth. That's what worship is, the word worship comes from the word that means worthiness. And so my life as an act of worship is a response to God. My worship should be heartfelt. As I said, it's not an emotion, but as a response to God, our worship should be heartfelt. John chapter four and verse 23, Jesus said, an hour is coming and is now here. Jesus said, don't look for it way out in the future when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Yes, truly, the Father wants people to worship him. That's the God that created us. Worship involves digesting great truths. As I said a while ago, the, the very definition of worship that we get from the scripture is the, the greatest worship is studying his word. And so worship involves digesting in, in the, the truth that we get out of the scripture deep into our hearts. And that's, that comes out as a response to God and who God is. Worship is, is worshiping a a, a deity, a being, a creator who's valued far more than everyone or everything. I mean, there are people in this room that I value highly. There are people in this room that I love dearly, but I don't worship you. You see, I would be, I would be perverting the word, the term, the meaning to worship somebody but I worship God. That should be our response to God for who he is because he's absolutely worthy and he's supremely valuable as creator. They asked Jesus, what is, the, what is the greatest commandment of all of the commands? You know, he's the son of God and, and maybe they're trying to trick him when they ask this question, but they ask the question, what is the, what is the greatest commandment? I mean, if I really want to please God, what do I do? And this was Jesus' response. It wasn't honor your father and mother. It wasn't don't kill. 
Those are good things. But Jesus says, this is the greatest that you can do. Love the Lord, your God, with all of your heart. What is that? Worship God first. God supreme. Everything in my life, every day, should be a lifestyle of honoring the God who saved me and redeemed me. No one, no thing, nothing. That's why when Paul went to the marketplace in Athens and he saw all of those idols, he was so grieved because that place that had been noted for its religion had all of these things that they were worshiping. And he begins to teach them. He uses that one that they have the idol to the unknown God. And he says, let me tell you about that idol. Let me tell you about that God. That's the one you should be worshiping. That's my God. That's my Jesus. Paul begins to tell them, that's the one that I encountered on the road to Damascus. That's the resurrected that's the God that came to this earth and died for your sins, but he didn't stay dead. And I, I met him in his resurrected body and he redeemed me too. That is worship. Worship is, worship is a choice. I will bless the Lord at all times, the scripture says. Isaiah 12 and six says, cry out, sing citizen of Zion, child of God. Why? Why does Isaiah tell us to, to cry out, to sing as children of God? Why? He goes on to say the second part of verse number six, Isaiah chapter 12, for the Holy One of Israel is among you in his greatness. That's the presence of God. You see, worship should be giving not getting. As I said, we, we look for things, we look for places, we look for churches, we look for people. Who can bless me? Who can help me? Who can give me? It's about get, 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 get. That's our culture. But you see, worship is the opposite of that. Worship is giving. The why of worship. I worship God because of who God is. Let me give you two definitions. Praise. Praise is a good thing. But praise is a response to what God does. I praise God because he protected me. I praise God because he saved me. I praise God because he healed me. That's praise. But worship is a response to who God is. God, if he never did another thing for me, I would honor him and bless him and worship him because of who he is. The eternal God of heaven and earth. We praise him for his mercy. We praise him for his many answers. We praise him in response to his works, but we worship him for who he is. And the psalmist is telling us as Christians, as the church, we have to get back to the dynamic of our daily life, worshiping God for who he is. I'm not worshiping him for what he's done. I'm not worshiping him for what he will do, but I worship him because of what the psalmist tells me of all of the things God is. Look, look very quickly through Psalm 95, verse number one. He's the Lord. He's the rock of our salvation. Verse three, he's the great God. He's the great king above all gods. Verses four and five, he's the creator of all things. Who is he? Verse six, he is our maker. Verse seven, he's not just some transcendent deity, but he is our God, personal. Let us come and worship him. It's very personal. Verses eight and 11, after verse seven, it says he's a gentle shepherd, a great shepherd. Verses eight and 11, he is the God of history who called and delivered the nation of Israel even when they turned their back on him. That's who he is. 
As you move to the New Testament, it reveals God himself as in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. As I said, all he did on the work of Calvary, Emmanuel, even the announcement of his birth, God with us. We worship Jesus because he is our savior, our redeemer. He paid the penalty of our sin. We worship God because of who he is and we worship God because of who we are. As you read that list of who God is, he's the, the great shepherd, we are the sheep. He's the creator, we are the creatures he created. He's the king, we are the subjects of his kingdom. He's the master, we are his servants. He's the vine, we are the branches. He's the owner, we are the possessions. I mean, scripture teaches us that there is not a hair that falls from your head that he doesn't have numbered and accounts for. Scripture teaches if he takes note when the smallest, most insignificant bird falls from the sky, he takes note. And that's why scripture teaches us to worship him. So how do we worship? Well, that's where this 11 o'clock hour comes in. One way we worship, one way that facilitates that worship, one way that recharges that worship for our daily worship is our corporate worship. If you look at Psalm 95, you go down through there over and over again, it says, let us. Six times he uses that phrase, let us. Corporately, we come together, we worship, but not just corporately. We also worship him daily, singularly in our lives, in our response to who he is. Hebrews 10, 25 commands us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Why? because of the importance of that corporate worship. And then he goes ahead to say, so much the more as you see the day approaching. Prophetically, when the end times come, and I believe we're real near, that's when he says, don't forsake coming together for corporate worship because you need each other to encourage you. Look at what he says there in verse number one. How do we worship? He tells us to worship verbally. Man, some of us have a problem with this. Some of us can't even sing. And all he says is make a joyful noise. He didn't say you gotta be able to carry a tune in a bucket. But he says when you come together, when you worship, sing, shout. You can't sing and shout if you don't open your mouth. Sometimes it's hard to be blessed sitting on the premises when you're supposed to be standing on the promises. And that's what he tells us here, how we're to worship. We're to worship physically. He tells us to bow down. He tells us to kneel before the Lord. Psalm 47 says, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout to God with a voice of triumph. Psalm 64, I will bless you while I live. I will lift up mine hands in your name. Psalm 134, lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. I've noticed there's one song we sing, and I'm not blaming anybody, but we're Baptists, and there's one song we sing. I grew up with that song, Lift Your Hands. We've changed the words to that somewhere. When it goes on the wall, it says, Lift Your Hearts. Bless our hearts. We need to be lifting our hands because lifting our hands is an act of surrender, and worship is where we surrender to God. And if nothing else, we come in and say, God, here I am. I'm surrendering to you. I worship you because of who you are. You see, worship is an attitude and an action. Worship should involve all of our responses, our mind, our emotions, our will, our body. It's a total surrender. Worship is more than just a few songs on Sunday. Worship is a lifestyle. And the psalmist is urging us, don't be like the Israelites. God himself comes in at the end of that psalm and God says, that whole generation disgusted me. I don't know about you, but when the scripture's being written for 2022, 
when the scripture's being written, the, the history's being written for my life, for my era of time. I don't want God to say, I was disgusted with your generation. But as I look about, as I see our culture, what else can God say? Can I change it all? Much as I try, much as I wish I could, I can't. Can I do anything about me and mine? Yeah. I can commit to worship. I can commit to total surrender. My entire self, my thoughts, my emotions, my prayer would be, God, it's all here for your use. We're to worship obediently. Worship is a choice, but worship is also a matter of obedience. God commands it. God deserves it. I found a little saying about worship. I'm talking about sometimes how worship can get emotional and active. And in those instances, this is the quote. It's not how high you jump, but how straight you walk when you hit the ground. It's not for show, but it's between me and Jesus. It's not what anybody else sees or thinks, but it's my daily walk with him. Here's the second quote. The best public worship is that which produces the best private Christianity. How do I live my life when nobody's looking? Do I worship God when it's not for show, when it's just me and him? When that ultimate worship is study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth? Am I obedient? Am I making the right choice? Questions we all have to answer for ourselves when the psalmist tells us, worship your creator. Joe, come lead us in a hymn, brother. As you stand, some singing, some praying, but if the word of God has challenged you, if the word of God has convicted you, if the Holy Spirit is asking you, urging you, do something, change something, be obedient to that this morning. Sometimes that's just a quiet commitment right where we are. Sometimes that's reading the scripture and the scripture pricks your heart, pricks your conscience. And you say, God, that brings me up short. And sometimes right at the altar call, you can do that when the Holy Spirit's speaking and the Holy Spirit says you're, you're short in that area. And during the song time, during that contemplation time, during that commitment time, I mean, it's great when we come and we get saved, somebody's lost and that's, that's, that's great. But when it's a room full of people that maybe they don't need to be saved, people watching that don't need to be saved, but they're saved, but maybe their life is just not what it ought to be. That relationship is not as close as it ought to be. And the Holy Spirit saying, you need to work on this. You need to fix this. At the same time that somebody needs to get saved and the devil would keep them from getting saved. They walked out the doors and they're lost. That same devil would take us as followers of Christ, Christians and and God would say, you need to do this, need to change this, need to work on this. And the devil would say, oh, you got, you got time. You can do that later. Don't, don't do that now. And we're just as defeated as that person that goes out lost. If we're a Christian and we don't say, God, I commit. God, forgive me. God, help me. And make that commitment to him. This is the time right now. Is the Holy Spirit speaking to you? Maybe something I didn't even say. 
but because the presence of the Holy Spirit is in this place and the Holy Spirit's dealing with you on something, maybe totally unrelated, but the Holy Spirit's saying, now's the time. You be obedient to him this morning. That's what this is all about. Joe, you lead us in a hymn of invitation. obedient to that. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. May we all be looking more and more looking to the face of Jesus. I thank you for your attendance. Thank you for your attention. Thank God for his presence among us. Pray for one another, lift one another up. Paul tells us that we're to encourage the household of saints. Look around, see somebody that's not here. Give them a call, give them a text, shoot them a message. Let them know that you missed them. All hearts clear. Braxton, would you dismiss us?